before I go into all the scumbag, ugly stuff about Black Lives Matter, allow me to say something nice. You see, we always say something mean. Well, not always, but when we're talking about leftist scumbags, I'm generally pretty mean. And don't get me wrong, Black Lives Matter, they're as scummy and ugly as it gets. But I do have to give them credit. Branding really is everything, isn't it? What a name. Black Lives Matter. It's so simple. It's one you can't disagree with, right? Are you, are you saying you don't think Black Lives Matter? What, are you some kind of racist? It's beautiful. It's so perfectly done. But it is important for you to understand this. We have never seen anything like Black Lives Matter in the United States of America. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been violent domestic terrorist groups before. We've had the KKK, we've had the Black Panthers, we've had other violent, there, there, there was a nasty anarchist wing that actually shot President McKinley and killed him early on. I know, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna history nerd out on you, but we've had violent domestic terrorist groups before. But what makes Black Lives Matter different is this one has the approval of America's cultural institutions. Uh, the, the violent domestic terrorist groups before were shunned for the most part. Sure, you'd have some, some maybe a sympathizer here or a sympathizer there in power, but for the most part, you're not advertising. Coca-Cola isn't advertising its pro-KKK stance. Of course, that's absurd, even back in the day. Today, Black Lives Matter, they've been mainstreamed while they're burning and looting and killing people mainstreamed. How many TV screens have you seen it on? How many commercials? Professional sports leagues. The NBA, from my understanding, has it painted in large letters across the floor. Players are wearing it on their jerseys. Politicians are championing Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Hollywood celebrities, musicians. It's everywhere as if they're the cool new hip thing. As if this is just some, you know, civil rights group just trying to do the right thing out there. It's stunning. We've never had anything like that happen before in the United States of America, ever. A violent, racist, domestic terrorist group that has the approval of America's cultural institutions. I don't know whether that says more about how Black Lives Matter has branded itself whether it says a lot about this horrible white guilt society we have, which is really weird, or whether it just says that people don't really pay attention. They don't really look into things. I think people don't understand that Black Lives Matter didn't just pop up out of the blue. Black Lives Matter has been murdering law enforcement officers for years in the United States of America. Do you remember that horrible, horrible night in Dallas when five Dallas police officers were gunned down and finally they had to send in, I believe it was the SWAT team with an exploding robot to kill the guy because he wouldn't come in alive. You know what he was saying during that negotiation time? Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Did you even know that? These people have been killing people for years. And yet my son, my, one of my sons, logs into one of his video games one day. And the loading screen pops up. Black Lives Matter. They're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. If Black Lives Matter, if they were Muslims, if Black Lives Matter was a Muslim group running around, maybe, maybe something on their head, yelling out, Allah Akbar, doing the exact same things they're doing, you and all of American society would have no problem whatsoever rounding up every single one who was a citizen and throwing him in a dark hole forever. And everyone who wasn't a citizen, you'd have no problem with the government authorizing drone strikes on them. But instead, because of what? A label? White guilt? I don't know. Because of something, we've somehow decided this group is legitimate. They're not legitimate. This is domestic terrorism. You don't get to hold people hostage like this, hold cities hostage like this, violent acts against civilians and police officers, burning, looting, 
you, you're not free to just do that here in this country. Trump, I'm glad he's waking up to what they are. They had Black Lives Matter. Where did it start? Marching down streets, screaming, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. They were talking about policemen, policemen and women. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. So all of a sudden, this has taken on this air of uh, great respectability. Well, how does it start there? It's a Marxist group. It's a Marxist group that is not looking for good things for our country. And now I see these leagues all kneeling down. And again, nobody has done more for the black community by far. I always say nobody other than, I'll give the one exception, Abraham Lincoln, okay? But even that, I mean, to be honest with you, but nobody has done more than I have. He's right about that. I don't care if that makes you uncomfortable. He's right about that. But especially the Marxist part, and it's not as if they're hiding this. I've been screaming this from the beginning when everybody was acting. I mean, everyone's posting everyone's posting things on their social media, Black Lives Matter. And I was trying to tell people, have you idiots even gone to the website? It's not like I'm some king of research here. Just go to blacklivesmatter.com. It's laid out right there. They have their mission statement. It's, it's a verbatim list of things a bunch of commie scumbags want. They don't hide who they are. Jeez, they admitted it. I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, Myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, We uh, are trained Marxists. Um, We are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. They don't hide it. Why does everyone else hide it? That's the best thing about it. You know what? Credit to Black Lives Matter for that. One, for the labeling. Two, they're open, uh, very open about what they believe. They believe cops should be killed. They believe in Marxism. They believe it's, this is written on their website, by the way, the destruction of the nuclear family. It's one of their, it's one of their points, as if it's just, you know, a commitment to excellence. We're going to destroy the nuclear family. They, they lay all this out, and all of society seems to ignore it or, or doesn't believe them. Oh, oh, that's not really what you believe. You're just civil rights, right? Oh, no, no, we, we, we want to kill cops. What? Oh, no, you don't really believe that. No, we do. They're out there saying it all the time. And the, the most amazing thing, I think, of this whole thing, it's not the Black Lives Matter scumbags. It's the acceptance in American society of the fact that we are carpet bombing the standard of living for many black people in this country and we're doing it acting like we're race crusaders. You know these urban black neighborhoods, these poor urban black neighborhoods that are crime ridden dumps? You do realize like 98% of the people who live in that neighborhood are just poor, right? They're not a bunch of criminal scumbags. They still have to live in these neighborhoods. Once all the race crusading is gone, once the police have been defunded or won't come there anymore, they still have to exist in that environment. And there are some seriously ugly, violent people raised in that environment. Good, law-abiding Americans are now going to be stuck in a living hell because of Black Lives Matter. At least A.G. Barr is out there speaking truth. Here's what he had to say. The rule of law is the foundation of a civilization, including economic prosperity. And that's why these so-called Black Lives Matter people, they're not interested in black lives. They're interested in props. A small number of blacks were killed by police during conflict with police, usually less than a dozen a year, who they can use as props to achieve a much broader political agenda. Bravo, A.G. Barr, because that's 100% right. Remember... You don't have to accept lies just because people shout them in your face. You don't have to accept lies because the latest celebrity tells you you have to. The latest NFL team tells you you have to. The latest commercial tells you you have to. I don't care if the whole world screams in your face that the sky is green. You don't have to accept these lies. And you do not have to accept the lie that American police officers are out there hunting down unarmed black men for the color of their skin. That's a bald-faced lie, and there's not a single piece of statistical evidence to back that up. Not one.
screw Black Lives Matter. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. We'll be back. Joining me now, former police officer and founder of TatumReport.com, Brandon Tatum. Brandon, I feel like people are under the mistaken impression that a police officer is absolutely forced to respond to every single call out there and forced to respond in the exact same way. Could you explain the discretion a cop uses? Well, in policing, you know, we, we use calls for service, right? So when people call, we can show up, we can respond. But the responses differ depending on the jurisdiction and depending on the training. So not all officers are created equal. Not all, all officers have the same training. And not every call is the same. People act different. People react differently. So there's a variety of different ways that police officers respond. Um, and I think people should know that. One thing you could do to help understand that is if people would do a ride along on the police department, they'll be able to see the contextual uh, reality of law enforcement in America. Brandon, how does somebody do a ride along? I, I've been screaming this from the hilltops. I'm th so glad you said it. Someone needs to ride along, especially with all these keyboard warriors out here today. Of what he really should do is then go to the chokehold and then slowly go to this. And so, could you please explain to people what they can do and is it safe to do a ride along with a police officer? A hundred percent, people should do a ride along. Most Americans have no idea what's going on with policing. They have no idea. They're, they're completely in the dark. But when you do a ride along, you can have a reality check on what exactly police officers do. Very, very simple. Go to your local substation. You can call into the substation or you can physically go there depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Tell them that you want to do a ride along. As long as you're not wanted for murder or anything like that, they'll let you go on a ride along. That should be your number one priority if you actually care about law enforcement in America and you want to get something done or, or get a better perspective. There was a terrible video out there, I'm sure you've seen it, of two police officers in Tulsa wrestling with a dude on the side of the road. The guy's clearly messed up, if not insane. They are pepper spraying him, doing everything underneath the sun. One of those officers, God rest his soul, is dead now. It was an ugly video. I don't recommend people watch it unless you've got a strong stomach. But for me, it really brought home the issue of how are you supposed to subdue somebody who doesn't want to be subdued. You and I have hung out before. You're a big dude. And still, it's not necessarily cake to subdue, subdue another grown man who doesn't want to go down and do everything exactly the right way so you don't get fired. Well, Jesse, what you got to do is overwhelm them with force. That's how you combat people like that. The reason that that officer, or one of the reasons, other than the, than the suspect being a complete lunatic and a deranged killer, um, the reason why the officers ended up getting in that position because they wouldn't use extreme force against these people. They want to pity pat around. They want to give him pull his arm. They want to do this. You got to start punching these people in the face and you got to start being more aggressive than they are. If you don't, you end up getting killed. This is exactly what we used to do on the Tucson Police Department. We weren't pity patting around with you. We tell you to do something. If you don't do it, we're going to use overwhelming force against you in order for you to comply. And the force that we consider that as is reasonable and necessary force to ex execute an arrest. And it's reasonable to punch somebody in the face if they're starting to gain leverage over you and they're starting to get themselves in a position where they pull a gun and shoot you and kill you and, and shoot both. He shot both of the officers. So uh, unfortunately, one of them died. But I'm not I'm not trying to down the officers. I'm just saying that we need to stop pity patting around and playing nice and thinking we're out here uh, arresting little high schoolers. You need to get busy. If you're going to put your hands on somebody, you need to put your hands on them and make sure you execute an arrest without getting killed. Amen. Brandon, I am worried about America's cities. Now, everybody's not a big city person. I love the country and I love the city. I love it all. But I like New York City. I, I like the big cities in this country. I think they're cool places. And I think there are about to be some very crime-ridden, dark places in the future because everybody with a dime is going to move out. That's one. So you're eroding the tax base. And two, I'm worried the cops are all going to leave. We're hearing all these rumors about cops retiring in droves, cops transferring in droves. What are they going to do when the cops pack it up and say, you know what, I'm out? See, not only are these police officers leaving, which is a big problem, through retirement, quitting, and they're just walking off the police department, but also the police officers that are there are not going to go up and beyond to save your life. 
they're not going to go up and beyond to do calls for service. You know, it's a it's a concept called proactive policing, and that's where a lot of crimes get solved, and that's where a lot of communities can see an uptick in, in in safety. Is when police are proactive, meaning that they're not waiting for somebody to call them; they are out searching for criminals and suspects and guns and things like that that destroys the community. So now you see police officers are not doing proactive policing; they are waiting until the very last minute that somebody calls them for help, and then they show up. And subconsciously, some of these officers are probably not going to show up with a positive attitude. They're probably going to show up worn out. They're going to halfway write your case report. They're going to halfway do an investigation because they don't get paid well. They don't get any respect. And they wish that they were somewhere else other than in the uniform. Not all police officers, but those things happen. And when you put them all together, that's a recipe for disaster for many of these major cities. Did you experience respect when you were an officer? I did, but when, I tell you what, it started going downhill, especially in minority communities, when Barack Obama was trashing police officers on a national scale. But by and large, people who were reasonable respected police officers. I even had criminals who knew the G-code, what I call it the G-code, meaning that you know the code when you're in the hood on how to participate and act. When I would catch them, run them down, they would say, yeah, Big Tatum, you got me. I'm going to go ahead and lay down. I'm going to go to jail, and then I'll get out, and I'll do better next time. Or you won't catch me next time. Uh, this whole spirit of fighting the police officers, shooting police officers, and stuff like that is it, not even hood code. I don't know what kind of you know environment that we've created now to where these people are bludgeoning police officers and doing the stuff that we see them doing. How did we create it? How did it happen so fast, man? Because I'll be honest. I, I agree. Obviously, you saw it. I wasn't a cop under Barack Obama. I've never been a cop. But I saw it start under him, and it seemed like just overnight, just overnight, we've somehow, not all, all of us, but a big percentage of this country has decided the cops are the problem. How did that happen so fast? Well, a, a big majority of this country, whether people want to believe it or not, are ignorant, and they're sheeps. You could tell them anything, mm. you know, and, and they'll believe it, and they'll run with it until the cows come home. But the thing is, is that we do have individuals of our population who got common sense, like you and I, Jesse, that we can see what's right and, and when it's right and when it's wrong. And a lot of these people cannot see it. The media is infusing propaganda into the minds of some of these sheepish people. And they're also infusing uh, rhetoric and politicians are following that rhetoric and it's leading down a path of confusion. My wife and I was just talking about the Steelers putting an idiot on their helmet. This fool did a drive-by shooting, kid, shot another black man, and end up running from the police. They, he either reached around or something to, to shoot the police officer. They didn't find the gun on him. Now they're out there protesting and crying, and he on the back of somebody's jersey. I mean, this is foolery. They are supporting <laughs> thugs who, who, who try to kill other black people. I mean, we, we've gone off the rocker, man, but I'm not surprised because a lot of people are ignorant and sheepish. How do we fix it? I mean, what's a genuine solution to fix it? Because I think a lot of people look at this stuff and they look at these Black Lives Matter scumbags and these Antifa scumbags and they want them stopped. They want it to stop. But a lot of people feel powerless, man. What? How do we stop? How do we solve this? I think we got to keep speaking against it. One of the powers that the BLM uh, terrorist group have going for them at this point is that they can promote rhetoric and, and have people feeling guilty. So there's there's some white people that are very genuine about wanting to help black people in America. But BLM is a farce. And those suspecting, unsuspecting white people, I believe, um, they are going out of their way to try to overcompensate to support an organization that don't want support. They're trying to uh, have unity with an organization that want division. They're, they're trying to give equality and justice to an organization that just want revenge. And so I think people got to stop kowtow into these individuals, start standing up for what's right, don't fall for the, and get into the matrix of white guilt and other things of that nature. The same thing can be applied to every other race, but don't fall for that. We need more people to run for office that got common sense and that are good people that can get in positions of power. We need more people to be teaching at schools that have common sense and knowledge. We need to infiltrate a lot of these areas so that we can try to combat the narrative and the, and the evil um, backwards thinking mindset of some of these lift, leftist maniacs. Brandon Tatum, TatumReport.com. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Hey, anytime, brother. Dude is right, man. We got to keep speaking up. Otherwise, only the scumbags speak. All right, we'll be back.
Joining me now, Mr. Vince Everett Ellison. He's the author of a new book called The Iron Triangle. And before I go into everything this book is about, I actually want him to explain it to me. Vince, what exactly is The Iron Triangle? All right. Good being with you, man. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, I was born on a cotton plantation in Haywood County, Tennessee. And um, my father was a sharecropper. And he worked hard and bought us out of poverty in the insurance industry. And I uh, went to college, and I lived a pretty good middle-class life. I started working in a prison when I was a young man in South Carolina. And I saw we had reverted. We were going back. Uh, a lot of black men were going to prison back then. As a matter of fact, in South Carolina, we had three prisons in the 80s. They ended up having 40 by the end of the 90s. So I started asking the black intelligentsia what was going on. And they said it was those evil, rich, white, conservative Republicans that hated black people. So I decided to resign my post, get a nonprofit organization to try to nail these rich white Republicans to the wall. But when I got to the black community, I saw that you would see a unicorn before you saw a rich white Republican down there. But I did see these three entities that were making a lot of money off the chaos. And I called them the Iron Triangle. They are most black preachers, most black politicians, and most black civic organizers. And they are paid by white liberals to keep the, Demo to keep the black people in line for the Democrat Party to do one thing, to make sure that they vote 90% every two years for the Democrat Party. And that's why I call them the Iron Triangle. Most black preachers, most black politicians, most black civic organizers. And they are the enemy. It is not white conservatives. It is these guys. And I tell you, boy, they make a lot of money off of it. The Sharptons, the Jesse Jacksons, the Black Lives Matter, and of course, all the politicians, Maxine Waters and Jim Clyburn and that crew. So that's why I call it that. Vince, I, I expect politicians to be scumbags. In general, I just do. I'm not, I'm not blown away. Republican, Democrat, it's politicians. I just expect yeah. they're going to be a scumbag. What has disappointed me greatly, especially over this horrible division I've seen recently, is the pastors. You brought up the pastors. Yeah. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. look, I walked away from my church. I haven't been back in two months. I'm still searching for one. We got scolded about our white privilege in the pulpit and things like that. And you're talking about black pastors doing the same type of, type of stuff. That really gets to me. How does that happen? How does a pastor get that twisted up and think that's the word of God? You know, money, man. I mean, you know, Jesus said, mm -hmm. he said that they, many will come in my name. Uh, they'll do these great works and they'll do them so well that you'll think they're the very elect. But his disciples said, Lord, how will we know them? He said, you will know them by their fruits. He didn't say by their works. He didn't say by what they said. He said what they produce. And we look at what they produce and they produce nothing but carnage. Uh, you say you cannot get good fruit from a rotten tree nor a bad fruit from a good tree. So these guys were rotten to the core. Jesus said they'd be here. And right now, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't be a victim. And I'm an heir of Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. And if you are a white Christian, you should live in condemnation. Uh, he said that there's no condemnation in those that believe in Jesus Christ. So this is an, an apostate religion. Christianity is Christianity. And these people, as we know, and Jesus said self, self he said it before. He said they were going to come and they were going to lie. And it's here. Let me know when you start a church so I can finally start going back to one. I'm kidding. I'm going to look. I'm going to start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for one. Why well, write a book, Vince? I, I'm curious about it because, look, I'll, full disclosure, I was a bad student. I know you're going to find that shocking. I hate writing. I despise it. And I see books like this, and I think they're important. And I look at it, and I think, how could somebody sit down and write that many words, though? Just thinking about it makes me want to vomit. Why write a book? Well, I kept getting these questions from conservatives and really from myself. How, why do black Christians vote for the Democratic Party in such mass? And why is it so difficult for us to leave this very, very terrible party after they've done so much damage to the black community? I mean, uh, ever since we've been part of the Democratic Party, all they've done is kill us, murder us, and keep us down and keep us poor. From 1800 to 1860, slavery. They uh, took us to Civil War and almost killed uh, a million Americans to keep their slaves uh, from 1860 to 1865, 1865, uh, they had Jim Crow, you know, murder, rape. So I wrote the book to explain this, not just to myself, but to my, to my conservative friends and the black conservatives that don't understand it either. The book talks about Stockholm Syndrome, cognitive dissonance. It talks about the power the Iron Triangle has over the black community and how they keep us under control for the Democratic Party. That is their job, and they do it very, very well. What's a sharecropper for people who don't know? Well, he, the sharecropper, uh, 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 that, that line of work started after the Civil War. 
when the slaves were freed and the uh, masters wanted to keep the crops going, they could no longer keep them in slavery. So they said, you would stay here on the plantation. You would work the crop. You would do all the work. We sit in the house, but we pay for everything. And then at the end, we will take all the um, expenses off the top and we split the difference with you. And so my father grew up in the South. And for 100 years, that's how black people make their living. And my father was the first person to break that, break that generational curse and get out of that line of, of work because it just kept people in bondage, kept them in poverty. And the Ku Klux Klan threatened to kill them when they decided to vote in 1960. Uh, and these were the Democrats, of course. But black people still voted for the Democrat Party because they started identifying with their master. That's what Stockholm Syndrome is. You identify with your master. And we've been identifying with ours for the past 220 years. And this book is it, it, it's a primer to teach conservatives why we do what we do, but how Christians can help their fellow Christians get off of this plantation and start living their lives and start living free. Are we getting better? Or are we getting I know it would be easy to look at the television set, especially over the last few months, and say, ah, race relations are worse. I mean, sure, look, I've had my moments where I look and think, we're going backwards. Like, all this is, this is creating more racist on every side. But is that true? Are, are Americans really still struggling with race as much as the media wants us to believe? This election is going to tell it. Um, I hear so much bad stuff when I talk to the black community about Black Lives Matter. Uh, we, we're starting to call them uh, burn, loot, and murder. We don't call them Black Lives Matter anymore because they're destroying mm -hmm. the black community. Uh, they have such an anti-Christian concept in how they view the world and how they view life. Uh, victimization, um, um, uh, 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 burning, looting, hurting the fellow man, non-forgiveness. This is not how we are supposed to live as Christians in America. And 85% of black people still say they're Christian. You also know that about 87% of the people that are out there marching are not black people. They are they are woke white people who are basically the losers of society and they want to use black people's pain for their gain. This election is going to tell a lot. It's going to tell whether or not we, we have reverted back to the old civil rights movement, which was a movement that really did not free anyone except white women. Uh, black people have gained nothing from the civil rights movement. I mean, uh, uh, Harvard did a study that said that um, the schools are seg uh, still are more segregated now than they were before Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the Washington Post did a study that said that there has been no narrowing in the wealth gap between black and white people since 1968. The black plan has been destroyed. Uh, the city's on fire. We have drugs. We have crime. We have more black men locked up now than we, uh, uh, 10 times more than we had during the 60s. And yet we're celebrating something, and I don't understand it. It's like going to Cuba, uh, and they're still stuck in the 1950s, and the people still, still scream, Viva la Revolution, no matter what you show them. They still believe that revolution was a good thing, even though they are trapped in poverty and despair. The black community is the same thing. Uh, and I saw this great story that said that you are more apt to get uh, struck by a bolt of lightning than shot by a police officer. Nevertheless, they've convinced black, the black community that this is our biggest problem, getting shot by police. Not education, not crime, uh, not poverty, uh, not disease. No, it's getting shot by a police officer, which, I, again, I said, you have better odds of getting struck by lightning than that happening. But, you know, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro and Lenin would be blushing at the type of mind control they have in the black community. Vince Everett Ellison, this man will be back on my show. I promise you that. Thank you, sir. That was outstanding. Man, thank you. I'll be back anytime you need me. Appreciate you. All right, brother. That gone, man. That guy needs to stop writing books and run for president or something like that. All right. We'll be back. Joining me now, Buck Sexton of The Buck Sexton Show. He helped me along in this business, I should point out. Buck, right after the George Floyd killing, you and I were out there, and it was lonely out here, saying, um, all right, that looked really bad. I get all that really bad. You know, prosecute if you have to. But let's not pretend Black Lives Matter is a decent organization of just some people who want equal rights. And it was lonely, buddy. It was awfully lonely. And now look what they are. Still murdering people and burning crap everywhere. And, and Jesse, I, I appreciate that, that you have a, a recollection of this because I'm seeing a lot of conservatives even now, a lot of Republican elected officials 
who were acting like they were fighting the good fight when I seem to recall them saying, well, well, there's good ideas about police reform and maybe we can reform the police. And if we reform enough, then maybe they'll stop burning down businesses, man. Like, yeah, this was idiocy from the beginning. I said it. You said it. We don't make national policy based on one emotional incident that we did not have all the facts for. We certainly don't throw almost a million law enforcement officers under the bus collectively as systemically racist because it appeases the far left Marxist activists that tried this whole thing before. I mean, Jesse, you and I just remember recent history. I know you like actual history, so do I, but recent events in this country where BLM was a movement that had to go away when everyone figured out, oh, some of their supporters actually just go out and kill cops. And now we're seeing that again. Yeah, I feel like everybody just forgot or chose to forget, or maybe because it happened under Barack Obama. A Black Lives Matter activist, and we all watched lots of this on video, executed not one, two, three, or four, five Dallas police officers in one night and died yelling Black Lives Matter. Somehow that just passed over. This is a violent, racist domestic terrorist organization. It's not some civil rights group just trying to overthrow the Jim Crow laws. These are bad people, and everyone has to pretend now that they're great. And I'm glad you pointed out the Republicans. Remember when we had Republicans, like my own senator, that idiot John Corn here in Texas, trying to pass Juneteenth bills? Because that's what we really need. That's what'll work. No, if we had just agreed to tear down all the Christopher Columbus oh. statues. And, yeah. and I mean, in the UK, they were tearing down Gandhi statues. That should have also been a tell for everybody when Europe was having BLM protests. It's like, oh, this is just a mass diversity and inclusion based virtue signaling ex- exercise. It has nothing to do with anything, right? I mean, there are there countries you had, you know, Denmark and Sweden practically having protests about the what is what does BLM have to do with that? But sure enough, that's that's what we saw. And a lot of people fell for it. And there was it's a lesson for everybody, Jesse, that, you know, we have we have this right wing media that pretends there are a lot of people in it that pretend. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak the truth. They do whatever they have to do to keep the stations, the channels, the sponsors they have. And when the fighting gets tough, it's in fact some of the people with the biggest bank accounts and the biggest reach who are the first to cave. Yeah. Man, that is that is a sad state of affairs. You brought it up earlier about the emotion after it, because it was this is the era now, and I think I think we as a society are still having a hard time dealing with this, where you can see everything. There, there's an internet video out there for anything you want to see, the ugly stuff too, and it only takes a moment to get a real reaction to people. It's something when you can see it on camera. How do we? filter that buck what do we do as a society whatever we're doing is not working we are now governed by twitter people don't want to admit that and maybe most people who are watching this aren't on twitter but the fact of the matter is the most powerful people in the world are and they think it matters and enough and if enough of them think it matters then it does what do we need to be doing differently that's an excellent question and i i wish i had a ready answer i have some some general thoughts like we're a country right now where it's like 330 million hamsters are all having a weird electrode experiment done on our brains. This is new in human history. This is new in human politics that I can sit and just intake, uh, you know, political memes, ideas, videos, slogans all day long. I mean, you think about, you know, cults in the past, uh, religious fanaticism, Brainwashing used to be kind of hard, Jesse. You know, sometimes you had to hold people at spear point, make them sit down, listen to your book, you know, take take whatever it is they're going to give you. Now we're doing it to ourselves. I mean, when you see the way these these information ecosystems have become closed circuits and that then they, they run 24 seven and people never have to have their ideas or, or thoughts challenged. That's part of, I think, why we see this new left isn't what we grew up with. I mean, the left used to be, look, we dominate most of the media organizations. So we can let conservatives have a little bit of their territory. Now in the internet age, you have this whole, you know, Gen Z and millennial cohort. That's like, what do you mean their ideas get to exist as well? 
These I, I cannot process. I cannot handle. The ideas make the synapses in my brain explode. I can't do this. And so they openly want to shut it all down. But it's because they haven't had to process very much from the other side ever, which is remarkable when you think about it. half the country disagrees with most of the people I live around in New York City. And most of those same people have no idea what half the country actually thinks. It's astonishing. It, it, is. it is. It is an odd time to be alive. Buck, I, I'll give you another big one here. I've been, I've been thinking on this, and I know I should have a solution, because it's my job to have strong opinions, and this is one of those ones I have no idea. I understand there's nothing worse than a state-run media. I would never want it in a million years. It's disgusting. However, can we stop pretending that what we have in America is in any way healthy for the nation or somehow better than anything else that's out there? What we have right now is bad for the country. It is. It is going to shorten our life term as a country, as a nation. What's the solution? How do we fix that? I think that uh, national journalism in this country, journalism as a profession, let's put it this way. There are worse people than journalists, Jesse, right? There are murderers, rapists, you know, child molesters. There are people who are worse than journalists. And there are some good journalists who are good people. That said, as a profession, I think American journalism is the worst most fraudulent, most immoral profession that's legal in the country right now. I think they're worse than the private equity robber barons. I think they're worse. You know, you find somebody out there that's doing something that's legal. I mean, I'll take ambulance chasers over journalists because at least ambulance chasers, you know what you're getting. Uh, I, I think the only way to get around this now is uh, effectively what we're doing. And look, I know this sounds self-serving, right? Jesse, you and I are part of the resistance to this resistance, in a sense, right? The resistance against Trump. But we're, we're, we're part of the, of the counter-revolution, and I think that that's necessary. I think that, you know, when you look at societies in the past, there have been groups of people who have said, hold on a second, the, the, the people calling the shots, making all the decisions, running the narrative, they're really bad. We need to get rid of them. That's how I feel about American journalism. I, I don't think that we need a little bit of a tweak here or there. I think we need to nuke it from orbit just to be safe. And part of that is getting people to understand that this is, it's not the exception now, it is actually the rule. Journalists are trying to promote certain ideas and they're leftists and they're activists. Everyone needs to understand that. And then all of a sudden the information can be filtered properly. As long as they can cling to this lie of objectivity, we're going to keep getting dragged further and further into the abyss. Buck, lastly... What we're seeing now undoubtedly is going to be a vacating of the United States of America's cities. I mean, not all of them, clearly, and they're not going to be ghost towns, but people with the means to do so are moving out. I'm hearing moving companies are flat out turning people down. No, I, I will not move you. We just simply don't have the time. Is that a net negative or positive 10 years from now for the country. I realize there's a great concern, I share it, of liberals leaving their crappy city and going and voting for their same crappy policies somewhere else. But aren't we better if we disperse a little? Is this good or bad? I think it remains to be seen because you also have a lot of people, you know, even in a city like New York, there are 8 million people here. There are about a million Republicans in this city, right? So there are, even in the bluest of blue places, you don't hear about it much, and we have no political power, but you get a large city, you're going to have a large number of Republicans. I mean, there are more Republicans in New York City than there are, you know, Republicans in Tulsa, right? I mean, you know, you, you go to red or... And by the way, mo I was trying to think of a city that's red, of course, and then it's not, you know, <laughs> there's really no red cities, which is part of the part of the problem i think fort worth is 51 percent republican maybe 55 percent republican yeah. but yeah yeah exactly just a tiny bit but i think that we're gonna have to see um how this plays out because there's the pandemic there's the crime there's the raising of taxes that's going to occur with all these democrats because they're going to need to prop up the welfare state and all the spending that they've been doing and then beyond that there's also the work from home component I mean, uh, that's what I think is going to be the huge game changer because, you know, right now, Jesse, as I explained it to people, you can order anything you need anywhere in the country off of Amazon. You can find someone to hang out with on Match or Tinder or whatever. You know, we, we have virtualized so much of what used to be an advantage of proximity in cities that the advantage of population density is going down. 
And I think that's going to be a long-term story. That's going to continue. Buck Sexton of the Buck Sexton Show. Thank you, my friend. Always great to see you, Jesse. Appreciate it. All right. We'll be back. Do not accept lies. And in this society now, especially with the social media society, corporations are activists now, it's so easy to just bow and accept them, isn't it? Oh, okay, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter is legitimate. You don't have to accept that. And not only that, it's important that you don't. We are in an era where lies are pushed around as truth and truth is treated as criminality. Don't take part in that. Good people have to fight against that. That's you. All right, we'll do it again.